<clears throat> hey, high school kids. Sure do miss seeing y'all around, but that's how it is right now. Hopefully it'll get over soon and we get back to where I can see your smiling faces every day. Hopefully that'll happen soon, but if it doesn't, we'll keep on going like this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, some of you haven't sent work in. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going kind of easy now since this is all new and everything, but it, uh, you need to send things in. Uh, I found the best way uh, to do that is uh, if I send, when I send stuff to you, and, I, and it would work the other way as well, but uh, open the attachment that, of the things that I send, uh, save it to a folder on your computer, type in the answers if it's worksheets or tests or whatever, things like that. Uh, save it to your com uh, save your completed work to your computer, and then upload the file, and um, and then uh, an attachment, and then email it to me. So that's how that goes. Most of you are doing that anyway. Most of you are way, way, way more computer savvy than I am. But that's life. It goes on. Uh, we're going to be combining chapters twenty one and twenty two together. Uh, you've done 21, well, now some, as I said a minute ago, some of you haven't sent things in, but uh, uh, we've done section one and section two in 21. Uh, I'm going to talk about that some today in a little uh, lecture form here, and uh, then we'll do the other, uh, the other work in the chapter, and then we'll do chapter 22, and then maybe later this week I'll be sending out a test to you to take. So uh, anyway, that's, that's where things are right now. So here we go. Uh, this is uh, this is section one in chapter twenty one that I'm talking about. It's on starts on page six hundred and forty in your book. Um, <clears throat> the test that we'll have will be the things that I talk about. Uh, still, you need to read the sections and, and uh, that sort of stuff. When you do the uh, the homework that I send send to you, you need to do it really completely because. Obviously, with this situation, I can't go over everything with you, let you ask questions and all like that. So, so uh, make it complete when you, when you do the work, please. We're going to be talking about uh, the Roaring Twenties. Here we are 100 years later, 100 years ago in the Roaring Twenties. As you'll recall, World War I had ended in 1918. Uh, people were still, you know, they were excited about that. But, now this is kind of an interesting fact. They had uh, been battling the Spanish flu. Over uh, 19 million people uh, died from that uh, here uh, in the United States and more than that around the world. So isn't it kind of kind of funny that, not funny, haha, -ha, but funny that uh, uh, here we are in, in 2020, and we're battling this thing, which is why we're doing this, this coronavirus type thing. So, as I've told you many times, history just kind of keeps repeating itself, just the time changes, the technology changes, all that sort of stuff. So, I just find that to be kind of kind of fascinating that here we are. Uh, <clears throat> after World War I had ended, uh, you know, people were excited, obviously, that the war's over, they, life can get back to normal. You remember the factories... Just like you're doing now, some factories are, I, I, I just saw in the news uh, recently that, uh, I believe it was Budweiser, has started to make uh, hand sanitizer in their factories. And, and this was kind of stuff that was going on in World War I, and we'll see it again when we study World War II. But life is getting back to normal <clears throat> in a lot of ways, and people are excited about that. Uh, a lot more people are moving into the cities uh, fewer people on the farm, that kind of stuff. Uh, and that sort of created a clash, kind of like you have now, I guess, in, in the United States. You, know, you have, uh, they call it the flyover states, and you have the east and west coast where the pe people's ideologies and things are so different. Uh, this was taking place back during the uh, 1920s as well, as people were moving around uh, into... Uh, uh, around the cities, so it became more of uh, uh, urban lifestyle as opposed to rural lifestyle, and those those things still exist today if you stop and think about it. But uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
But anyway, it was, it was a time of great change taking place. Uh, if you've read through this, which hopefully you have, if you haven't, hopefully you will, one of the biggest issues that was going on during this time was prohibition. For years, for decades, you had had these different groups who uh, saw the evils of alcoholism and, and, and they thought that needs to be done away with so that uh, you know, it'll make, uh, make America better. And uh, so uh, they went around, like I said, for decades trying to, to uh, get, that, get alcohol, uh, make it illegal. And finally they did <clears throat> with the 18th Amendment uh, when it was passed, saying that alcohol could no longer be um, consumed, uh, manufactured, any of that kind of stuff. They had some exceptions for uh, uh, communion in churches, uh, things of that nature, but uh, overall it was, uh, it was abolished or prohibited in any form. And it was during this time that, uh, I think we might even mention this before, uh, the uh, bootleggers, they called it that because they would take a, a flask and uh, put it in their boot so as they're walking around, nobody knows you have it, so that's where that term came from. Uh, they would go out at nighttime and make it. That's where moonshining, you know, that, that term came from. And also, even uh, NASCAR sort of got its start uh, you know, from the from the bootlegging, from the moonshine, you know, delivering the moonshine uh, in fast in cars and things like that, and then eventually they would uh, have, have car races and all, and and that just evolved into uh, into stock car racing, which is uh, you know a pretty big deal nowadays. But anyway, this 18th Amendment's passed, and and uh, some people are obviously are celebrating the people who who uh, you know uh, thought that alcohol should not be around. It does cause a lot of problems. It still does today. I would imagine that uh, everybody in our, our class may have somebody in their family or know of someone personally who has issues with alcohol. I, I know I do. So, so alcohol is a problem. It, it's, it's a real problem. And, you know, uh, uh, but at this time in our history, we did away with it, you know, thinking, okay, this, this will help. Well, it turned out it didn't help very much. <clears throat> uh, the main thing that came out of it was uh, was gangsters. You know, everybody's heard of Al Capone. You see a picture on 643 of Al Capone. Uh, a lot of uh, gangsters, as they were called, came out of this time period. And so that was probably the main thing that came out of it. Crime increased. Uh, the government tried to track down these people and all. As a matter of fact, uh, there was this uh, act passed called the Volstead Act. And it uh, established the Prohibition Bureau. And uh, there was a man named Elliot Ness. Uh, there used to be a TV show about him back when I was a kid. But uh, uh, Elliot Ness got this, um, uh, this special unit. And basically they had no, uh, no restrictions on them at all. And they would go around and, and try to uh, you know, uh, catch all these people who were doing uh, things with uh, alcohol, making it, selling it, uh, that sort of stuff. So he became, he became quite famous, I guess you could say. Uh, years ago, there was a movie made um, called The Untouchables. That's what his group was called. It's a pretty good movie if you're looking for something to watch uh, while we're, you know, sitting around uh, out of school. It was called The Untouchables. Kevin Costner and uh, Sean Connery were the stars of it. And it's Fairly accurate. It's you know, it's pretty good. It's, it was very entertaining. But uh, anyway, you know that's uh, it was about that time period, and it was based on uh, on some you know accurate uh, facts and that sort of stuff. But uh, <clears throat> during this time, uh, they came up with these secret clubs you could go to, and they were called speakeasies because you when you were in there, you had to talk very very quiet. And uh, you'd knock on the door, you'd have some kind of secret knock. And, you know, I mean, it's just, when you study about it, it's kind of silly, but it was, uh, it was very real. And, uh, uh, and like I said, Al Capone uh, uh, became a really big deal. I don't know, maybe sometime or other you've heard of the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. That's when Al Capone had all these uh, gangsters 
his enemy gangsters. I mean, they would kill each other all over the place, and especially in Chicago. And uh, uh, he had them gather up. They, you know, they uh, had uh, police, people dressed in police uniforms show up because they think there's, you know, they're going, they line them up against the wall and then they take their machine guns and shoot them all in the back. And it was referred to as the St. Valentine's Day Massacre because it happened on Valentine's Day. But uh, uh, Capone was known for his uh, violence to enforce his, uh, uh, his empire that he had developed. Uh, if you uh, had read the, the book, you would see where he was making $60 million a year through, uh, through crime type stuff, especially alcohol. So uh, um, it, was, it was a crazy time. Of course, I guess in some ways, every time is a crazy time. Um, on, the, on page uh, 643, at the bottom of the page, there's a, uh, a chart showing uh, facts about prohibition from 1920 to 1933, because in 1933, it was finally realized this isn't working and so they passed the 21st Amendment, which killed the 18th Amendment, which allowed alcohol to be made and produced again and, and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, you can see there looking at that, uh, the uh, causes, it says, and the effects of prohibition. For example, the first one says, various religious groups thought drinking alcohol was sinful, and the effect of that was uh, the alcohol consumption did decline. But then it says reformers believe that the government should protect the public health. And that started uh, a uh, disrespect for the law. That started all this organized crime, all that sort of thing. But you can see that there on page 643. Uh, look over there. Uh, that could possibly be some sort of question when we get ready for the test. Uh, just a lot of stuff was changing in the, in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, another topic... Uh, was uh, science and religion. It was during this time the Scopes Monkey Trial was held in in uh, Tennessee. Uh, you know, talking about uh, this this guy uh, was teaching evolution, and they couldn't teach evolution. Of course, now you can't, you can't teach uh, stuff about God. So we, you know, it's kind of a crazy world that we have. In my opinion: we should be able to teach both evolution and creationism. And, and give you give you what's known about each of them because you can't really prove either one, and then let people decide for themselves. But anyway, during this time, uh, it was called American fundamentalism, and uh, uh, you know there were people who believed uh, the you know the Bible word for word was true. I happened to, to be one of those. I believe it's in the Bible is true. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so so you had a lot of things like that taking place uh, during this time period, and. Uh, uh, so just a lot of a lot of turmoil, you know. It's kind of like today, and and as I've told you before, our nation's always been divided. We've never been truly together. Uh, there's always been some issue, you know. You go back to uh, the antebellum, and we talked about the you know the slaves, people for it, the slave uh, illegal slavery, people for it, people against it, and, and the nation was divided over that. And that led to a civil war. Uh, you can go back just you know pick just about any period and never or, or I would say never but seldom has our nation ever been united where we're all together agreeing on things and stuff we've always been been that way and probably will uh, probably always will because everybody's you know thinks thinks how they think uh, that cover section one pretty good y'all to read over it again and, and all uh, as we get uh, get ready for uh, tests that we'll be having here in some time in the the near future, uh, there was uh, a preacher during this time. I didn't mention him. I didn't go back and talk about him for a minute. His name was Billy Sunday, and uh, he was obviously, uh, you know, was excited. As a matter of fact, he had a picture of him. It looked like he was dancing. You know, he was celebrating the the passage of prohibition. That was back on page six hundred forty. But uh, he's thinking now. As a matter of fact, there was a quote from him. Uh, back on 640 says uh, here's what he said when this was passed the reign of tears is over the slums will soon be only a memory we will turn our prisons into factories and our jails into storehouses and corn and corn cribs <laughs> y'all don't even know what a corn crib is i bet men will walk upright now women will smile and the children will laugh 
hell will forever be for rent. That's a quote from Billy Sunday. And, uh, and the excitement in us, as we just said, that lasted until uh, 1933. Then the 21st Amendment came in and did away with it because basically all prohibition accomplished was getting organized crime going. And organized crime is still around today, obviously doing a lot of, a lot of stuff, which isn't um, always a good thing. Uh, moving on now to section two, the, the twi 20s woman. Uh, you see a picture there on page 646 under that one American story of Zelda Sayer Fitzgerald. Uh, you've probably heard of F. Scott Fitzgerald. If you haven't, you will eventually in your uh, English literature classes. You'll read um, uh, some books and things by him. This was his wife. And you can see there that uh, you know, that was a totally different look. And that was one of the things about the Roaring Twenties. Uh, it affected women a lot. Uh, not all women, of course, but you know the, the styles change. As you look through this section, uh, you see there, uh, looking on page 647, uh, flappers. That was, uh, you know, dance. Uh, uh, the young women were called flappers because of, as they were doing these dances, they, you know, they were doing a lot of, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of movement. Uh, they, were, they started, uh, uh, as you can see there, they, you know, they've they're, they got dresses on that come, just come to their knee, whereas in the past, uh, dresses you know, went all the way to, to their ankles. And so that was a, was a big change there for, uh, uh, for women. In, in styles, they, they cut their hair. There's a verse somewhere in the Bible, I don't recall where, that says uh, a woman's hair is her glory. And here they are cutting it off, bobbing it, making it really short. Uh, and that was, that was a big issue. You know, a lot of people thought, well, that's good. That's... Uh, uh, that's um, was something new and of course people like to be stylish and that was uh, the way they dressed the hairstyles uh, things like that really became a big deal during this uh, roaring 20s uh, for the women uh, as you recall from uh, world war one women had started working outside the home working in the factories <clears throat> because the men were gone off to war all that sort of stuff and so they started doing things they'd never been allowed to do and this was exciting when the, and I, if you if you did some research, you would find that after the war ended, most of them went back home and you know took on the traditional role of uh, of housewife and mother that kind of thing. But but uh, uh, several and especially young people, young people are more susceptible to change than than older people are. But they stayed in the in the workforce. Uh, they stayed with the, the style of uh, styled in clothes and haircuts and and that kind of thing, which. For a lot of people, thought, "Oh, this this is terrible. You know, um, this uh, is not good. Not good." Uh, uh, talked about one of your vocab words was double standard, and uh, a double standard. I, I think you would agree still exists today. Uh, you know, you you uh, here it said in, in the definition of the books is uh, a set of principles granting greater sexual freedom to men than to women required women to observe stricter standards of behavior than men did. I think still today, uh, you, you have that double standard. It's, uh, you know, uh, the boys get bragged on if they get, get uh, have a lot of girlfriends and stuff, and girlfriends are called names, not girlfriends, but girls are called names if they uh, have more than one boyfriend, that type of stuff. So I think that's probably still around today, don't you agree? But... Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, you, you had that taking place. Like I said, it's just a time of great change. Uh, work opportunities again. Uh, you see a picture on, on page uh, 648. A young woman uh, works as a typesetter in a publishing house in 1920. So uh, uh, it's a lot of opportunities that, that women hadn't had before. They now have. Uh, but it's just kind of like back in the hippie days when I was in college everybody wasn't a hippie actually there were very few uh, and of course history is made by people who, who uh, I guess go against the, the standards that sort of stuff but uh, so most women still weren't in the workforce but more were than, than had been uh, ever before and so that was a big change it says here I'm reading on page 648 
By 1930, 10 million women were earning wages. However, few rose to managerial jobs, and uh, wherever they worked, women earned less than men. Those, uh, if you do some research, you'll find those statistics still pretty much prove that, that uh, uh, women make less than men per hour. And of course, women fight against that because they, they feel like that uh, they should make the same. And if they're doing the same job, they probably should. But, uh, uh, but that's still issues today. And like I said, the history just keeps repeating itself. Uh, at the bottom of uh, 648, there's a bunch of pie graphs showing you 1910, 20, and 30, showing you how things had changed um, during, uh, during these time periods in um, um, the different areas that you can see there if you look at that chart. Another thing that was changing uh, big during the... Um, uh, during the 20s was the family. You know, by this time they'd learned more uh, different things about birth control, that type of stuff. So, uh, so uh, the birth rate, uh, you know, there was, a, there was a, uh, a, a growth after World War One. There's always after wars, you know, the soldiers come home and, and they just want to get back, you know, get to a normal life, and they look to get married and have children and families, that sort of stuff. And uh, <clears throat> these, all these changes brought that about. If you're going to work outside the home, it wouldn't be as easy to have as many children as you had in the past. But uh, uh, as you read there in your, in your book, uh, on page 648, it says this decline, talking about the birth rate, was due... Uh, in part to a wider availability of birth control information. Margaret Sanger uh, says, who had uh, opened the first birth control clinic in the United States in 1916, she's called the mother of Planned Parenthood. Uh, something that the book doesn't mention, but about Margaret Sanger, uh, she was a eugenist. You know, we talked about uh, how that's, a, that's people who think that certain people shouldn't be allowed to reproduce, that they're not, not fit, they're not qualified, they're maybe mentally challenged or physically challenged. And, of course, during this time we're talking about, uh, <clears throat> if they were black, you know, they were thought, thought to be inferior because this is in the, sort of in the peak of Jim Crow uh, uh, time period that we studied about. And uh, so she starts... Uh, uh, going into uh, black neighborhoods and having these clinics set up for abortions and stuff because as a, a eugenicist, she believed that uh, uh, the blacks shouldn't be allowed to produce. They were inferior and, and they should not. Uh, and, and so anyway, so she's known for Planned Parenthood, but she's also known for being, uh, uh, you have to research to find it because they'll put that in the books. But uh, if you researched, you would find that she was... Uh, uh, big into uh, uh, abortion, that type of stuff, particularly in minority areas because of this belief that they were inferior and they shouldn't be allowed to reproduce. So that's, um, that's just kind of an interesting little thing there. Um, <clears throat> so women were facing a lot of changes during this time. Uh, also, look on page 650 and 651. This is more about, about your, you, your group of people, the youth, things that they did. You kind of see the, it talks about the fashions, uh, dancing. I mean, there's a lot of interesting little things there. So uh, read over that. Uh, you had this guy sitting on a flagpole. That was stuff that they did back in those days. Why? Who knows? Just to get attention, I guess. Uh, you know, people like to do things to get attention. Whatever it is. If it's, uh, if it's sensible or crazy, they still like to do it. But read over that page. I think you'll find that to be kind of fascinating. Um, you know, women were starting to smoke in public and, you know, just doing things that a lady would never do back, uh, you know, before that time period. And, of course, young people are, you know, they're the innovators. They're the ones who come up with new things and, and all that. So uh, uh, read over that. Um, I'll be sending you um, stuff to, uh, to do, assignments, some research and, and uh, papers. Remember, you got to send those things to me. Uh, so uh, 
So do that, please. And I'll be getting in touch with you over uh, by email uh, a little bit later on. So um, I'll talk to you later. Miss you. Can't wait to see you again.